the crew members of a B-29 in 1945 were trained in dropping large quantities of bombs on their targets, usually a large open battlefield or a settlement. But when the two infamous B-29s were tasked with unleashing the atomic bombs on Japan, their crew members knew for a fact that nothing would ever be the same again. And they were right. Nuclear weaponry would take new forms over the decades thanks to the arms race that followed. These new forms pushed the envelope in terms of type, yield, and delivery. This is the history that we're going to look at today, so put your radiation goggles on. Fat Man, Little Boy, and RD's One Knee. The first generation of atomic bombs relied on the basic principle of splitting isotopes of heavy metal elements. This was discovered by German scientist Werner Heisenberg when he found out that splitting a uranium atom released large amounts of energy. He also found out that a chain reaction could be set up, which increases the energy release to such an extent that everything around it would be obliterated. This is how a nuclear bomb works. If you've watched Christopher Nolan's epic Oppenheimer, you'd obviously know that J. Robert Oppenheimer learned this from the man himself. And as both of them went to work for opposing sides in the war, the race began. Oppenheimer got there first with Fat Man and Little Boy too late to use against Germany. Japan was fair game for both bombs, however, as uranium-235 and plutonium-239 were used respectively. The primary challenge for these was the separation from their atoms, and these processes took up a huge chunk of the U.S. government investment behind the Manhattan Project. Of course, the Soviet Union was not content to be left behind, and they created the plutonium-fired RDS-01. This was a rather scandalous affair for the United States since it had been revealed that secrets were revealed by the Rosenberg couple leaking information from Oppenheimer's Manhattan Project. Indeed, the political firestorm caused as a result of the Soviets acquiring the bomb was touched upon in the film. This first generation of nukes was intended to be delivered by manned aircraft. For the USA, it had been the aforementioned B-29 and B-36s, while the Soviets relied on the Tupolev A-4 and the Tu-16. Because of this, it was also pretty common to call these bombs gravity bombs, sounding like something straight out of a military sci-fi piece. Of course, the newly commenced nuclear age must have felt like that back then. All sorts of interesting ways to kill the enemy with the power of the sun were being dreamt up. Nuclear artillery and other fun ideas, both nuclear powers were looking for anything that could give them a decisive edge over the enemy, and this meant they got creative. The streamlining of production processes and new ideas in packing the radioactive isotopes used by nukes helped them get smaller gradually. The US Air Force experimented with air-to-air -air nukes. Its result was the Air 2 Genie, a rocket armed with a 1.5 kiloton warhead that was intended to destroy strategic bombers in flight. It was obviously much smaller than the Fat Man and little boy bombs given its intended use. In the same time period, the Davy Crockett, as it was known, came into existence. This was a recoilless rifle that fired the smallest yield nuclear bomb in history. U.S. Army planners saw its use in destroying mass waves of Soviet infantry supported by their tanks in the event of an invasion of Europe. This crazy thing was obviously never used in combat, but the idea of a tactical nuke was set in stone by now. There was no getting rid of it. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, decided to instead pursue the raw power of the hydrogen bomb, a design that Oppenheimer famously refused to pursue. As it relies on a fusion reaction, its sheer capabilities of destruction outstrip anything by Fat Man or Little Boy, both of which employ a fission reaction. Edward Teller, the Hungarian scientist who notably betrays Oppenheimer in the movie, was the one to enable the US to get there first. But later in the 1950s, planners decided that tactical nukes should be the area of focus. This enabled the Soviet Union to go ahead and create the Tsar Bomba, which is still considered to be the most powerful nuclear weapon ever created. Its 50 megaton output makes Fat Man's 21 kiloton output look puny and insignificant. We'd argue that the test of the Tsar Bomba was the one that fully set the nuclear arms race in motion. This was the point after which there was truly no going back, and the prospect of total doomsday at our own hands fully set in. 
either way. The development of nuclear rockets eventually paved the way for ballistic and cruise missiles, with nuclear tips, which eventually became the most preferred method of delivery. Cruise missiles, tech world powers found cruise missile technology to be rather effective for taking out specific vehicular threats. These included battleships, mobile command posts, tanks, and even stationary command bunkers, or to their subsonic speeds. Their biggest advantage was cost. The most famous of those is obviously the Tomahawk, but nuclear-capable cruise missiles were created by the U.S. prior to that. These included the MGM-1 Matador and the SLAM developed in the 1960s and 1970s. Such missiles were used by the United States to stand as a ready arsenal to attack allies of the Soviet Union at a moment's notice. The famous Tomahawks also began receiving nuclear tips in the late 1980s as the Cold War tensions flared up to a new extreme. But with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the capability had been foregone by the Obama administration. Recently, however, there have been calls for sea-based nuclear-tipped cruise missiles to be redeployed to face the Chinese naval threat, ITBMs. A supersonic missile typically used for nukes is more than 20 times faster than a bomber. If you wanted to guarantee the destruction of the enemy by leaving little chance for them to stop your warheads, supersonic proved to be the way to go. Previously short-range, both powers had developed technologies that allowed for the missiles to cover intercontinental ranges, berthing the ICBM. Some notable designs from the middle of the 20th century include the Atlas, Minuteman, and Titan. The Minuteman is special for a reason we'll get into soon. They weren't that effective in the beginning, something which was slowly rectified as computer and radar technology became more and more sophisticated. By the 1980s, a nuclear-tipped ICBM could precisely target a small military base. Treaties had been signed back and forth to limit the rise of ICBMs between the powers. But let's be honest, who's really going to back down in such an environment? And no one did. For others, these treaties simply became a tool for calling out the biggest military powers ethically. ICBMs quickly became crucial to the concept of the nuclear trident where a country strives to maintain the capability to launch nukes from all three dimensions land air and sea for launching from the sea submarines became highly valued since they provided a mobile launching platform far away from areas that would usually find themselves targeted by the enemy one thing that did in fact happen over the course of the 1980s to the 2000s was that India, North Korea, and France developed their own huge arsenals of nuclear-tipped ICBMs. Notable ICBM designs from these powers include the Agni-5 used by India, the Dongfeng series of ICBMs used by China, the M51 submarine-launched ballistic missile fielded by France, and finally, the ingenious Hwasong series fielded by North Korea. MIRVs and MARVs, what if you could launch multiple nuclear warheads in one rocket and have the warheads spread out to hit different targets? That's what was achieved with the Minuteman in the 1970s, the first multiple independent re-entry vehicle. Coming at the target in an arc, they may travel out of the atmosphere and come down on the target to release its payload. MARVs employ much of the same philosophy, except they are able to maneuver their trajectory to a great extent before coming down on the target. Its only downside, though, was its requirement of a direct radar homing signal, such as that on the Pershing II. In both types, each warhead then goes away to attack different targets across large distances. Such missiles are actually the ones that are mostly depicted in global nuclear war scenes, such as the one in Terminator 3. Rise of the Machines With the introduction of MIRV technology, a single incoming enemy missile necessitated the deployment of multiple types of interceptors. This resulted in the cost-efficiency ratio heavily favoring the attacker, ultimately propelling the concept of mutually assured destruction to the forefront of strategic planning. Hypersonic missiles and glide vehicles, hypersonic missiles are all the rage now. Ever since Russia unveiled the Kintel and the Chinese announced the development of their design, the ballistic missile arms race has been heating up again.
until 2022. Speculation raged about whether or not they can be armed with nuclear warheads, and the confirmation came when Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov admitted that Russian hypersonic missiles can carry nukes and are designed specifically to defeat U.S. defense systems. Of course, hypersonic glide vehicles are delivery systems carrying nuclear warheads that can maneuver to avoid defenses before destroying their targets. Glide vehicles are all the rage now, with much of the U.S. industrial complex engaged in developing at least four different designs such as the HTV-2 and the CGHB. China had begun the development of the very basics of the DFCF launch vehicle in 2016, prior to beginning work on their standalone ballistic missiles. This goes to show how serious this arms race was always bound to be. Hypersonic missiles in general are capable of traveling at speeds exceeding Mach 15. If MIRVs made mutually assured destruction a certainty, hypersonics have the capability of making it an ironclad law. On the flip side, it could convince non-nuclear powers that they need to have nukes that threaten other powers as a defense no matter what. This is currently where nuclear evolution stands. We are at the beginning of an all-new arms race. Although Russia may fall out in the coming decade, the ultimate showdown between the USA and China will be reminiscent of the Cold War. All that's left now is space. Now we'd love it if you nuked the subscribe button. Consider giving this video a thumbs up as well if you like what you've seen. Thanks for watching.